We launched a new initiative here at Annenberg called the Civic Engagement and Journalism Initiative, really just a month or so ago. And the founding question on which this initiative is launched is, how do we create and evaluate local news websites designed to have a meaningful impact on civil society? As you all know, civic engagement is an important value uh, that cuts across the lines uh, between communication and journalism and public relations and among the centers here. And uh, we wanted to make that manifest in a couple of our initial project sites, which are part of it, Alhambra Source and Intersection South LA, and the research partner, which is the Metamorphosis Project. This civic engagement and journalism initiative is also the first project of the Laboratory on the Social Frontier, which is a joint effort of the Schools of Journalism and Communication to support community research. I'm thrilled that you all are here, including quite a few folks from Alhambra. And uh, it's now my pleasure to turn the program over to Daniela Gerson, who is the head of our initiative. Daniela. Thank you. So, thank you, Geneva, for having us here today. Um, I am very excited to see so many people who are here from Alhambra and also people who are producing community and local media. Um, I want to start with a question. Who here has a local news site in their neighborhood, a hyper-local site? This could be um, a patch site, or can you raise your hands if you have one? East Sider, LA, which we're very excited to have the editor of. Keep your hands up um, if you have any of these. Um, Alhambra Source, raise your hands, yay. Um, Boyle Heights Beat, raise your hands. We just had the Boyle Heights Beat editors walk in. Um, well, okay, my experiment to have you keep your hands raised didn't quite work, but the point is that there has been an explosion in local news in the past 10 years. And even as we've seen a decrease in mainstream local news coverage, these sites have gone from essentially none 10 years ago to more than 1,000 across the country today. Many of these sites have a mission that includes impacting civic engagement through local journalism. Um, two examples are Patch, which is a networked approach that has more than 800 sites today across the country and was started by AOL. It says that Patch is revolutionizing the way neighbors connect with each other, their communities, and the national conversation. Mission Local, which is an example of a university-affiliated site, which is run through Cal Berkeley, says they believe that by covering a neighborhood fairly and thoroughly, we can build community in a sustainable model for quality journalism. But the question of how do we know whether or not these sites are actually responding to community information needs and whether or not they're having a meaningful impact on civic engagement is a tough one. Um, a recent study that was done by JLab of sites across the country found that they actually don't have good tools to measure meaningful engagement. And that this affects both the future of their operations, but it also affects the impact that they can have on their communities. The Civic Engagement and Journalism Initiative was created to look at these questions of how we can create sites that respond to local information needs, and also how can we measure them, and then in turn make these sites better as we, um, as we integrate the impact from the communities and their needs. In today's talk, George Villanueva is going to talk, who is a um, a doctoral student and PhD candidate, is going to talk about the Metamorphosis Project approach to studying communities and the framework that it has created. And then we're gonna, I'm going to talk about how we've applied that in Alhambra with the Alhambra source. And then both of us are going to talk about how we're taking steps moving forward with the Civic Engagement and Journalism Initiative. So now I'm going to turn it over to George. Great. Thanks, Daniela. Um, so the Metamorphosis Project has been studying how local news and information kind of impacts civic engagement in urban communities throughout greater Los Angeles. For over uh, 10 years, uh, we've been studying not just uh, South LA and Alhambra, but also local communities such as Pasadena, um, Glendale, South Pasadena, Glendale, and also Pico Union neighborhoods, among others. Uh, 
So the key thing uh, that the metamorphosis approach did to create a framework for understanding local urban communities is actually get into the guts of communities and listen to, uh, to actually how um, the, the lo uh, what we call a local neighborhood storytelling network consists of. And these consist of uh, three different nodes uh, that uh, are the residents and families, also the community and nonprofit organizations, and more importantly for this talk, uh, geoethnic media or local media that's uh, aimed at a particular geography or ethnicity. And what we find is when this network is very uh, healthy and very well connected, that it impacts civic engagement positively in, in urban communities. And uh, what, what we mean by civic engagement, we like to go beyond kind of traditional measures of civic engagement that has been tied to, to traditional political participation, such as attending a city council meeting. Uh, we also look at uh, more meaningful attempts at civic engagement, such as belonging or subject, subjective feelings or attachment to a neighborhood. Also, civic participation in terms of how citizens are involved in discussing and also resolving a local problem. And ultimately, uh, collective efficacy or um, uh, when a neighborhood can come together and actually go beyond an individual and actually try to solve a problem collectively and take action upon a problem. So, uh, Danielle is going to talk a little bit more about how this was applied uh, to Alhambra, both from a research and evaluation design, but also from a journalistic practice design. So Alhambra Source was started with what Professor Michael Parks often calls a simple question. Does journalism matter? To answer that question, he teamed up with Sandra Bar. Um, with communication scholar Sandra Balro Keach and her metamorphosis team. Alhambra was chosen for a few main reasons. Um, how many people here have been to Alhambra before? And what's the main thing that you know about the city? Okay. Food. <laughs> Cars? Anything else? What else? 710? Yeah, too many people. Too many people. <laughs> okay. Um, the reasons we chose it actually weren't any of those reasons. Um, um, they had to do with what George explained in terms of civic engagement. And Alhambra figured very, had low levels of civic engagement by the three measures that George just outlined. Um, for starters, a study in 2001 found that it had the lowest sense of belonging of eight neighborhoods in the Los Angeles area, a study that Metamorphosis conducted. The other was civic participation. And again, civic engagement is defined broad, broader than just civic participation here. But in terms of civic participation, it was found that in the elections in 2010, there were five candidates up for re-election. And nobody challenged them. And so because of that, municipal elections were canceled in 2010 in Alhambra. And the third reason was this question of collective efficacy. When we did focus groups, we found that there were essentially three different storytelling networks in Alhambra. There was an ethnic Chinese storytelling network. As you saw before, most of Alhambra's population is Asian, and most of that is ethnic Chinese. Um, there was a Latino storytelling network and an Anglo storytelling network. The second reason was that the decline of mainstream local news coverage <coughs> directly impacted Alhambra. Um, there used to be a local newspaper, the Alhambra Post Advocate, that ceased to exist. The Los Angeles Times essentially stopped covering Alhambra. At the same time, the Chinese press increased. And what you saw is there's now three dailies that cover Alhambra. But when we spoke to city officials, from police, from schools, from city, um, city council, they said they were not reading the Chinese press coverage. And so that, as you can tell, there were three different, essentially three different storytelling networks. And the Alhambra Source was created in an attempt to bridge that and create a more cohesive storytelling network. Um, I'm going to just briefly explain. We grounded in, in extensive community information needs research. I'm not going to go into details on that now. But if you have questions, I'd love to answer them. Um, we recruited community contributors in an attempt. We also attempt to cross language divides and to create a formative feedback loop from the community so that, like so many websites, this was an iterative process, but a process based upon communication research. Um, I'm going to focus on two elements of the site. One is the question of how do we cross the linguistic and ethnic divide in Alhambra. With the site, we wanted to create a site that was fully trilingual. 
Um, our resources, we didn't have the resources to do that when we launched, but I do think that we've crossed language divides in important ways. One way is taking the Chinese language press and translating it into <coughs> English. Um, for example, police officers, the um, public information officer for the Alhambra police, on a couple occasions told me he didn't know what was being reported until he saw the stories in Alhambra source. Um, another way is we do, have, we do have machine translation on the site, which is Google Translate, and so you can access the site in different languages. As any of you who have used machine translation know, it's far from perfect, but it does give you sort of a sense of what's going on. And the third way is that we have multilingual contributors who are reporting on the community in different languages. Um, the other element that I wanted to focus on is why a community-driven site? Why have so many community contributors? The way in which the site started was with, actually, Neil Garlapardi, who's here today, was one of the first. Um, we had a meeting of five community contributors. And since then, it's grown to more than, actually now, more than 60 community contributors who, and when I define community contributors, they're people who have um, contributed one story and attended one meeting, at least. We also, these community contributors are extremely diverse ethnically and speak more than 10 languages, but what surprised me was they're also very diverse age-wise and background. We have people who are mechanics to jet propulsion engineer, um, engineers. And they came together to report on their community. In doing so, they have impacted civic engagement. Um, one way, if you think back to the definitions of civic, um, of civic engagement, one is in terms of sense of belonging. Um, Joe Sung, who's back there, um, wrote the story on A equals Americanized, B equals better, C equals Chinese. Mm -hmm. The ABCs of San Gabriel Valley Chinese restaurants. It's a satirical story, but it gave a glimpse into a different perspective. Um, another more serious story, written by Nazar Nabilhosen, who is also back there and is our new editorial fellow, um, had to do with what it's like to be a young Lebanese woman growing up in Alhambra in a community that's predominantly Asian and Latino, and some of the challenges that she encountered. Another way that these first per, generally first-person stories have had a much greater impact than I, as a professional reporter, I believe, could have had in the community are in terms of generating civic participation. Um, one example is make these stories on making Alhambra a bike-friendly city. Now, Alhambra is well known for, has anyone here bought a car in Alhambra? Um, you should ask. <laughs> yes. Um, Alhambra is well known as a city that all has freeway issues, and this is the place to buy cars. But two community contributors who are actually here today both said this is also a place where it actually could be a really bikeable city. And they wrote from their perspective, but also reporting on some of the issues in terms of um, where the needs are, what different organizations are getting active, what, how the city council is responding, and wrote these stories that are from a personal perspective, but looking outward. Um, they had a they've had a tremendous impact. They've started, they've created a platform for community organizations who are working on bike issues to get word out about what they're doing. And they've also held city government accountable in terms of meetings and then later to create a master bike plan. Third example of the story has to do with um, Anthony Perez's story where he wrote about um, some of the challenges at Alhambra High School. Alhambra High School is about half Asian and half Latino. But it's had a huge achievement gap, and it's also had a huge participation gap from Latino students. Anthony asked the question, why were there no other Latino students involved in student government? And it's a story, this is an issue that keeps coming up at Alhambra High. It was written about in the LA Times, it was written about in the school paper. Usually it creates like a sort of tinderbox impact where it explodes and then people get offended and then nothing happens. With Anthony's story, the result was the teachers listened to the piece, they had a meeting about it, and another teacher working with students created an organization to try and get more Latino students involved in student government. And I really think it makes a difference that it was coming from his voice and rather than from an outsider voice. Now, as you can see, project evaluation design has been, <coughs> is very complex, and I'm going to just focus on two elements today because we have short on time, but again, I'd be happy to answer questions later if anything in here in particular you have questions about. One that I want to focus on is the two-wave um, trilingual survey of Alhambra residents. Now, we were fortunate to be able to go in to this project with a baseline study and to really be able to look at 
what were, <coughs> what, where was Alhambra before the Alhambra source? So that we could then later measure what was the impact. This is something that most sites don't do. And because of it, it's harder to create a narrative for the impact that you have and also to know what impact you have. Um, so we've done the first study and we're hoping that we'll have the funding to do a second study to measure the impact on civic engagement and intergroup relations. The other element that I wanted to focus on is the question of agenda setting and on the media. Um, this is something that you can now, for most of you out there, I see we have Jesus Sanchez who runs the East Side of LA, we have some um, people from the Boyle Heights Beat out here. For some, most sites, you don't have a large research arm affiliated with your site. And I found the agenda setting with the media was an element that has come out of this project that I think other sites could adapt as well. Um, when the elections were canceled two years ago, the Chinese press reported upon it, but it was not reported on the mainstream press until Alhambra Source did, at which point the Pasadena Star News picked it up, and then that became a story that more people were aware of. Um, similarly, this year, I'd like to say that all the candidates were challenged, but they were not in the elections, but this time there are two um, incumbents who are being challenged, one of whom actually started getting involved with issues after reading the Alhambra Source. We reported on that recently, and then World Journal, um, one member of the Chinese press, picked up that story, and that was actually just this week. Um, another example is this story on, there was a terrible murder in Alhambra where a woman was strangled to death and left in a park. And that story, like many sensational murder stories, was covered by the mainstream press for a day, and then was left alone. And actually, our web developer, who is an Alhambra resident, um, was walking in the park and he saw a sign. He teamed up with a USC student who is a, um, an international student from China, and she interviewed the father in this case and got his perspective on the struggle that he was going through and some of the challenges of trying to figure out and navigate the U American justice system. That story then got picked up by the Star News, which actually this should probably go, and then the LA Times picked it up from the Star News. Um, but that's one example of the way in which we are impacting media um, through the site. These are, this is, I wanted to just give you an example of some of the methodologies that are being developed. Now these are methodologies that we'd like to further develop now as we expand into the civic engagement and journalism initiative. This is beginning, the way in which this is beginning is Alhambra Source teaming up with Metamorphosis as well as Intersections South LA. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Intersections, it was created in 2009 by Willa Seidenberg and Bill Salas in an attempt to get more USC students reporting on the underserved community that surrounds us here. <laughs> And what we are doing, we're trying to do is to share um, practices, but also expand the research impact as we move forward. So I'm going to go through a few of the next steps. We're fortunate enough to have on the team um, Dana Chin, who could not be with us today because she is part of a group that is consulting with foundations on ways in which Analytic, web analytics can be used to, more meet, to measure engagement in a more meaningful way. And she's going to work with us and with her classes on that moving forward. <coughs> Another element that we're doing is Reporter Corps. Um, and if, can you guys raise your hands, actually, Nazar and Ishme and a few other people who, who else is here who's community contributor, or some of the community contributors too, actually. So Alhambra starts with more than, as I said before, more than 50 community contributors. But what I found right away was they broke down into two groups. There were the community contributors who were already established in their careers in some way. And then there were the younger people who were generally between the ages of 18 and 26. They had either were in community college part time or they had finished school and they were in a transitional phase where they had more time on their hands and were interested in getting to know their communities. And actually, one of them told me that she was going to go join, um, she was going to go join AmeriCorps. And I said, you know, you're doing a lot of good right here in your own community. Um, she's the one on the left over there. And so, based on that concept, um, we were lucky enough to receive funding from the McCormick Foundation to systematize what we have been doing with young adults reporting on their own communities 
They serve as natural translators, both because they s often speak two languages in an immigrant community, but also because if they can understand a city council meeting, and Ishmael, I'm going to call you out here for a second, but when Ishmael goes to the city council meetings, and the city council meetings in Alhambra, there's usually about, how many people are there? About like five? Uh, last time there was a total of three people that were associated with the city. <laughs> yeah. And how long did the meeting last? So the meeting lasted eight minutes. Um, but when Ishmael and Nazrin go there and find out the issues, for example, about dog parks or about recycling, and they then have found a way to, tran to translate that to their peers and to their, I mean, Nazrin last night brought her father along to the city council meeting. Who, how long has he lived in Alhambra? Um, over 20 years. And what was his response at the meeting? <laughs> so, the concept behind Reporter Corps is to systematize some of the work that we've been doing with young adults in Alhambra and then to work to then bring that to South LA. Um, another challenge that we're looking at with the Civic Engagement and Journalism Initiative is how can we work with USC students in collaboration with community? Many universities have programs where they use the communities as pedagogical tools so that students can get experience reporting which is great, um, but I think that we can do better. And I give sort of three examples of ways in which that we've worked with community members and students so far. Um, one is through the, China, the students who've been translating have been, we have students with fantastic skills and writing skills here who've been able to translate the ethnic media and translate it back to the community. That's worked very well. It's worked much better actually in some ways than when I've worked with community members on that. Another is the Night Mobile, um, the Night Mobile project. Getting the name wrong. <laughs> there are a lot of names here, um, but the Night Mobile project this summer um, that paired engineering students, journalism and communication students, and business students. Um, and we have one of the students who was the part of it, Minja. And then the they were paired with community organizations. In Alhambra, it was Asian Pacific American Legal Center, and I saw a couple organizers from APOC sitting in the back there. And <laughs> they gave the grounding so that the students were able to go into the community and also meet with the community members we've already been working with and then address an issue right off and get started in a, much, in a way that was, they were immediately integrated with the community. And then the third way is to think about ways in which we can take some of the skills that students are learning here in terms of multimedia skills and reporting skills and pair them with community members in reporting. And that's what I'm going to be working on, actually, in a class this spring. And now George is going to talk a little bit more about the way in which we are going to further pair communication research and journalism in South LA and how this works into the larger um, communication infrastructure theory. Great. Thanks, Daniela. Um, so so the, uh, the project that we're actually also working on in collaboration with Intersection South LA as well is uh, what's called South LA Democratic Spaces. And in this project, um, as you know, much of uh, South LA in the mainstream news media and also the popular narrative has been a very um, bleak view of South LA as a site that's disinvested in and also a site where democracy doesn't really happen. With this project, we actually work with uh, community organizers and community advocates to tell uh, the stories of, of democratic spaces in South LA from their eyes and from the point of the advocacy issues that they're working on in the project, in the, in the area. So it's really a, 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 it's a collaboration between community-based researchers and also community journalists to, um, to create kind of media engagements about um, uh, local advocacy issues that affect the spaces in South LA. And there's 15 of them um, and uh, 15 stories. Uh, Made, uh, made possible by a grant by the uh, California Humanities Council. And also, uh, it's going to include a photo exhibit, also kind of different videos that will be uh, exhibited at, at, the, at the launch. The launch is uh, September 27th. Uh, there's these launch cards, and it's also on the U.S. Uh, Annenberg website if you, uh, you want to RSVP for the, for the event. So it's going to be an exciting time to kind of also interact with uh, the different organizers and community organizations that will be coming um, uh, to attend the event. And these include kind of traditional organizations like Community Coalition, 
and also Scope, and also uh, Trust South LA, which we've worked with at the Mobile News Incubator, and also work with a lot of kind of biking issues with the mobile lab from the Innovation Lab that Francois Barr also kind of heads up. So uh, we're hoping that you guys can come to that event. And, and really, if you, uh, if you really think about it, it's also a way where, if you're thinking about the, the storytelling network, it's a way where USC as a university can be inserted back into that storytelling network as a public citizen for the neighborhoods that they're working in. So they, they become more place-based as, as a university. They, they use their resources and also collaborate with the community organizations and the residents and families to actually create healthy local geo-ethnic local media to actually also talk about the spaces that surround uh, this network and actually impact that space, whether it be a physical place such as parks, but also kind of social spaces such as, as different meetings and, and youth councils. So that's, um, that's one of the ways we're trying to also kind of bring back this, uh, this framework about understanding kind of local, uh, the local storytelling network and how a, a university can actually affect that. So. Thanks again, and, and as we move on, we, uh, we know a lot of people here uh, work in either the communication research arena or the journalism arena, and also co community news field. So we'd like to kind of uh, um, invite kind of questions and challenges and kind of ideas about um, uh, moving forward and, and any kind of questions you have about the presentation. So thank you. Obviously, Danielle is on the board, Michael Parks, one of the co-founders of El Pembe Source, Sandra Ballro Peach, our scholarly queen. The queen of scholarship, Willis Seidenberg, who uh, of course runs, has been running and continues to lead in terms of intersection of South LA. Um, Dan Chen, you mentioned, and, well, and me. <laughs> so, um, questions for Daniela or George or contributions that any of you from Alhambra would like to, to make, things you want to add as either contributors or, oh, I want to introduce our two new staffers, they're both Nasrin, I know you're back here, who's really directing the board board. No, no, she's a, she's a managing editor. And managing editor, editor. yes. <laughs> and Yasmin, who is directing reporter for it. Yes. <laughs> no, I've got it. So, sorry, guys. We're delighted to have both of these two aboard. So what questions, comments? Dean Wilson. I'd like to do two things. One is uh, just say how proud I am uh, of the progress that this initiative has made. Uh, it's really a thrill to see it. When we first started these conversations, there was a group over here and a group over there, and they were doing all interesting things, but they were talking very much to one another. And I think that the leadership of this program uh, under Geneva Overholzer's guidance has really uh, produced something of tremendous interest and tremendous value to our students. Uh, to our faculty, and I hope to the community as well. So I really do. I think it's a model for what can happen around the country. But I would also be really curious to know what the folks who are actually working on this out in Alhambra have to say about it. Yeah. Uh, I would really, that would be a, a, a real, I'd like to hear that. Yeah. Collins. Yeah, yeah. Collins and people. Um, I'd say, Joe, do you want to share how you got involved in Ishmael as well? Um, I'm Joe Lassone, uh, with Daniele, and I'm um, I think a lot of it was just uh, the opportunities that the men in the school provided to us to kind of support our community. Because it really is uh, it really is two communities in Alhambra, Hispanic and Asian. And there's very little cross section. And this, this opportunity gave us uh, a means to kind of explore stories on all spectrums of population. And it helped us learn about our community as well, but it kind of, um, it also let people see when they read our stories that Alhambra is not a uniform community, whether you're 
Hispanic speaking Spanish or Chinese speaking Chinese, that there's uh, many different populations within the city. So I think it's been very helpful that way for myself as well as the community. I have to say, Joe, I'm going to help you here. You did mention that you consider yourself a simple hack, but you have a terrific editor here. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, she makes me into a writer that I'm not really me, so. <laughs> she, she denies that and says you're a terrific writer. <laughs> um, she's lying, I'm not. <laughs> Thank you, <Danielle. laughs> I think it would be interesting also, Kim or Mike, if you talk about um, working with APOL, in the community? You guys back there? Anybody from APOC willing to kick you in? You want to share what um, your work in the community and knowledge resource? Yes. Um, so, hi, my name is Mike Pedro. I work at the Asian Pacific American Legal Center. And I work with students in uh, Alhambra, the Alhambra area. And uh, I just found that working with the Alhambra resource is a really big benefit for us because, uh, uh, and a resource because we've had like staff members from Alhambra resource. Um, Partner with some of our projects, uh, and then you know, Danielle is even coming to some of our um, after school spaces and, and did workshops with the students. So, um, I think it's a really good venue for students to connect to the outside world because when she was saying, okay, you know, what are some issues out there? Have you heard the outside the source and all that stuff? You know, it really opens up their eyes to what's out there and, and, and making that connection to the community. So, so mm -hmm. they've been a great resource for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm the parent coordinator here, so I work with parents, and um, I have resources really helped a lot with like intergenerational dialogue and conversation between the young students who are learning how to interview older generations at different ages. So it's really amazing what I wanted to thank APOC and Trust South LA. As George mentioned, this summer, in what some of you will recall as having been the Annenberg Marshal of the Turby, <laughs> program that started four years ago and has had at least three or four names, but this year was the mobile news initiative. Um, we decided we wanted to work instead of with for-profit company, media companies, we wanted to work with nonprofits in our two communities of interest. So we worked with APOC in Alhambra and with Trust South LA in uh, LA, and Fosla Bar was very much involved in that as well. So it uh, really was a terrific experience, and that work is, in fact, continuing. We appreciate your partnership. So uh, I was really curious about the discussion about metrics and how you measure the impact. And I'm just wondering if you can kind of expand on that. You said that one thing is sort of the agenda setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then can you talk a little bit about um, uh, other avenues or other ways that you think you can kind of measure the impact here and also kind of what you need possibly to expand uh, how you, you view the sort of the, the reach of this yeah. um, Would you like to take this one or should I? Yeah. Well, one thing that, that the school has been wonderful in supporting, and, and this is a problem for other new sites more than likely, uh, we did get money from the school to do this baseline survey of their communication practices, their um, intergroup relationships, you know, how well they get along with people of another language and, and ethnicity and the like. And also all of those aspects of civic engagement. So this happened before Alhambra Source really was in place. And we're hoping that this spring, end of the spring, we can go in again and try and measure, not only is there an increase in civic engagement and improvement in intergroup relations, but was that due to Alhambra source? Because it could have been other things that, that might have helped there. The media thing, the agenda setting, is we do media monitoring. So we're constantly monitoring, monitoring the Spanish language, the Chinese language, and the English language media for their coverage of Alhambra. And one thing we'd like to be able to demonstrate is that we're increasing the Alhambra stories, not only because we produce them with these wonderful community organizations and contributors, but also because other media pick up the stories. And in many cases, I don't think I'm too jaded, they're not credited, but we know what the temporal sequencing was. Okay, so we're trying to actually quantify that and get measures 
Is there an increase of storytelling of Alhambra? And if so, to what extent is that due directly to us or indirectly through other media picking it up? Does that? Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, always very curious because often when people look at the metrics of these things, it's very clear that it's page views and things like that. And, and um, do you have any idea of just how well people know Alhambra Source and whether that's expanding? Yeah, one of the things we asked in the baseline survey was, how do you learn about what's happening in Alhambra? Mm -hmm. And most people that said anything said this Chamber of Commerce thing called Around Alhambra, mm -hmm. produced in English, but sent to every resident. So now we can say, how do you learn about Alhambra, or do you, through that work? Right. Yeah, we'll follow up, yeah. It's really interesting because so many of the people in Alhambra would agree with the statement that Alhambra doesn't have a community in any symbolic way. Mm -hmm. You know, people think of it as a transition zone or a place to go eat in good restaurants <coughs> or something like that. So it's really a, a very basic problem of how do you create this, this kind of civil society on a local level when that society is multi-ethnic and multilingual. And, and I think that is not unique to Alhambra. That's happening in Nebraska, you know. So. When you just chose Alhambra, did you have a sense of the uh, internet access in the community? Did you know whether it had good internet access among community residents? Yes, we have all of those data with a complete elaboration of their communication practices. What kind of newspapers, what kind of television, what kind of new media practices, and of course, ethnic media practices. So we have that a detailed profile. So we would expect that if Alhambra Source in some way helped to improve levels of civic engagement and improve the quality and quantity of intergroup relations, that it's going to be those people that are internet connected for the purpose of staying on top of their community. But maybe also those people who are connected to those geoethnic media that pick up our stories. So there are multiple ways. I'm a PhD in communication here. Just started yesterday. So, um, but uh, my name is Kristen Guth, so, um, and I'm really excited about this project. It seems really interesting um, as a former journalist and PR person. So this is really interesting. Um, I have two questions that are more structural. One is, how does Alhambra Source differ from the other types of hyper-local news organizations that we have, some of which are represented in this room? Um, and the other one is, how does Alhambra Source set itself apart from other local blogs? I live in Culver City, and there's a lot of competing blogs um, for saying, we have the information on local news. You know, you can turn to us and voice your opinions. I'm wondering how Alhambra Source is kind of setting itself apart as a news entity rather than a blogging network. Um, I think maybe, actually, to answer your question, I think first it might be interesting to hear from two, there's two other sites, there are at least two other sites here and how they function versus Alhambra Source, and then answer. I was wondering, Jesus, if you could just explain the way in which the East Side or LA works. Um, it's basically, you know, we do aggregation and also do original content, news and features, and mm -hmm. basically, you know, community input. And do you work with community members? And how uh, some, yes. We have some contributors, but we, um, uh, it's has to all go through me. <laughs> yeah. It has to be curated and edited. How many folks do you have you know, connected with, with this uh, in terms of working with? Uh, on an ongoing basis, maybe three kind of contributed photographers, and some of you will contribute to other publications as well. Jessica, you want to talk about, or Michelle, about Boyle Heights Beat? Um, sure. Uh, we at Boyle Heights Beat have a uh, community newspaper. This is a bilingual newspaper. Um, and we mentor high school students from the area to produce um, this newspaper. And along with that, we also have a website, both as well, 
um, learning English from Spanish, and we, we have uh, community contributors who um, I work with, and again, <coughs> we uh, also edit and help them um, publish on the, on the website. I just wanted to mention that Boyle High Street, for those of you who are new this year, is also a project of the Annenberg School. It's part of the California Endowment Health Journalism Fellowships, whose leader, Michelle Avender, is here. Um, so that's another one of our community. Yeah, and we welcome students who are interested. There's some roles we can have for students, but it's a little different from some of the other hyper-local sites in that it's the contributors are all local, either they're high school kids or they're adults, but there's mentoring roles to be had. Um, and it's also a partnership between um, uh, Annenberg and La Opinion. Um, so. And so to answer your question from the sites that I've looked at, um, there is a, there's a wide variety of approaches right now. Um, but I would say that most, I would say, are they rely less on community contributors. It takes a lot of work to build up a network of community contributors, and that's where it's fortunate we're working with the university on that. The other element I would say is that most are in affluent and predominantly homogenous, like more homogenous communities, and don't focus on this question of intergroup inter -group relations. Um, so that's where I would say is probably the primary distinctions. To me, the most distinguishing characteristic really is this association with uh, scholarship, an That's, attempt to oh, yeah. understand the effect of what we're doing, an attempt to draw on mm -hmm. deep research into people's engagement with their media and with their communities. I mean, I don't know that this kind of relationship between I don't think um, it exists. I've asked and practice. both um, Jan Schaefer and the I've asked. So I've tried to find other sites that are doing something similar. I don't think it exists. Um, and most sites do function the way in which a traditional newsroom does in terms of going out to report stories that the editor thinks are of interest. So for instance, if your editor's daughter is applying to college, you're going to do the story on applying to college often. And that's not necessarily what the readers want, since I've done that story. Um, <laughs> um, I was wondering if any of the other community contributors could share a little bit. Um, we've got a lot of you here, so maybe like, Ishmael or Nazarin about how you got involved and what how, what your experience has been like. Um, well, I graduated from college a few years ago and I went to school in San Diego and graduated at not a great economic time and found myself moving back to Alhambra where I grew up, which was not in my plan. <laughs> but um, I was kind of looking for something to do. I studied writing in college. And my friend from high school was the, one of the first interns, or maybe the first one? Yeah, she was a USC student. And she was a USC student of Annenberg, and she told me about and the source, and it had just started. So I thought, sure, my God, I'm not really doing anything. And I just started reporting on the community, and I found that it really, really did increase my, not only my engagement with the community, but I really, really liked it a lot more because I met local business owners or other community contributors who lived in the area and I just kind of started becoming okay with being back home, which is, I don't know if anybody's a boomerang kid as they call it, but <laughs> it, takes a, it takes a while to get used to it, but I'll have a source of a big reason why I, I fell in love with my city, which I didn't when I was younger, so it really did increase my engagement as a community. <clears throat> And your dad, is he still thinking of running for mayor? Uh, well, <laughs> after the meeting last night, I'm really interested in this. I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of civic engagement. Right, right. <laughs> Take over the city. Really? Yeah. Do you want to vote website? Neil or Joe? Uh, one thing I did find out, I mean, I've been living in Alhambra for about 15 years. And I didn't know who the council people were. I didn't know who the mayor was. And after about three or two, three years after Danielle has been with our Amber Source, whenever I needed information on water rates for a story, or talk to the police chief, Danielle, Danielle would tell me, oh, I know who he is. Give him a call. There's his number. And I thought, wow, that's fast. <laughs> <laughs> so she really networked quickly. And I found someone, you really need somebody strong in charge who's willing to go out there and kind of lead the way for the people who are actually contributing to the project. 
And that kind of helped give me impetus to do my stories and gave me confidence in my writing where I can get to about 70% there with my stories, but that 30% that she kicks in makes all the difference in the world. You know, like when you talk to people, sorry, Joe, I didn't mean to interrupt. When you talk to people, do they know about the number source? I mean, obviously your friends follow you, I'm sure, but. Yeah. I initially know, but uh, now when I say, when I talk to the police chief, I think I did about a couple weeks ago for the National Night Out, I like being part of the police day. I told somebody, oh yeah, I'm reporting for the Alhambra source. Oh yeah, yeah, I just talked to Daniela two weeks ago. Okay. So they know who I am, I have credibility, and now they'll talk to me as opposed to my being an ordinary citizen, they maybe wouldn't give me the time of day. So it's very important. Just kind of following on that question then, and your question. Hi, welcome. Hi, thanks. For um, it, kind of what, what I heard you asking, I thought I heard you asking about the brand, right? And the responses I heard were kind of back end. Like how, how, how the back end is different from the back end of other community sources. So I guess my question basically is how do you get people to read it? What's the sort of mm -hmm. strategy to get people to read it? In, in the sense of like how do you sell it? <coughs> yeah. Um, well, I see like Neil, for instance, was there when we started and there was no site. Um, and it's still, we're still selling it. Um, and we do it, it's been interesting when we've but done surveys. <laughs> we're still selling it for free, but it's, <laughs> it takes a cost. But we find like when we've done surveys that people found it in all different ways. So for instance, even if we just take the people who are here today, um, Joe found it through a Chamber of Commerce publication. Neil is actually a graduate of USC. Um, USC Annenberg, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sarah, who was here, I'm not sure she left. Oh, Sarah's here. You found it through an event. So we do events as well. Um, Celeste, I think, got signed up through the art walk. when we were at an art walk and we were out there signing people up. Um, some people through Facebook and other social media. And it does feel like one of these approaches where we, there isn't one avenue um, just being out there. But if there was any indicator, it was interesting to me that this week, I do feel like, for instance, the Chinese press, they took two of our stories. Um, and they're taking our polls and just running with them in a way that it feels like it's, maybe I'm wishful thinking, but it feels like we've hit a, like a new stage in terms of being integrated into the storytelling network. Um, but it's still, it's still a struggle and I mean this, yeah, each, it's trying to get more stories out there. But there is that also that question, the first slide I put up had to do with um, this, I don't know if you saw, but there was a slide which showed our traffic double. And so to get to the question of how you measure traffic versus social media, it was when a girl was hit by a car and was killed, a recent high school graduate. Our traffic doubled, but it wasn't sustainable traffic. And so we do see blips like that with stories, but the question of how we build sustainable engagement is one we're, and we're still struggling with. How much do you at Alhambra see the site as not only uh, a service for the residents, but people outside of Alhambra who don't know much about the, the mm. city itself? Well, I would sort of bounce that question back to, to you in terms of South LA. I think in a way they're slightly different, but, um, or I'd also ask some people who've been involved, do you feel like it's important to you that people outside of Alhambra know about Alhambra through any of the stories? For me personally, I've been very focused on Alhambra and not as much about letting people know about Alhambra issues. There are certain issues like inter-ethnic relations that we take on that, for instance, Joe's story on A equals American B equals, that one took off nationally. And some of these stories, they give perspective, I'd say Nazarene's story as well on Don't Call Me a Terrorist. Um, but mostly it's focused on engaging residents in Alhambra. Um, I don't think it's as much about create, in my opinion, um, about creating Alhambra civic pride, that, civil pride, civic pride, that would expand elsewhere. You know, in Bull Heights, which is a Latino community, what's interesting is that the young people who sign up for it or who apply to be in, in the project, um, almost all of them say that part of the reason that they want to do it is they want to change the image of Boyle mm -hmm. Heights. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I don't know, Willa, if you're finding that, but the communities are stigmatized. Alhambra really doesn't have fall into that so right. much. I mean, it may have right. challenges, but that's not so much one of them. So I, I have found that to be really interesting and really inspiring. And, and I think the residents who read it say something yeah. similar, too. Yeah. That's right on. 
that's one of the, the things that comes up in South LA more than anything else, that they hate the media because they stigmatize them. And it's true. I mean, we've done content analyses to demonstrate that. So. One thing I'd like to mention, uh, Geneva mentioned um, the unique part of having research and, and some conceptual framework to work within. But from my point of view, what I find most exciting is that I have to go into areas that I know nothing about, namely journalism. But we're always commenting on it. We're always writing about it in this scholarly way, you know, and research and all of that civic engagement. But actually having to deal with the issue of civic engagement on the ground, it's just been a real privilege uh, to work with journalists on this especially journalists that share, we share the same goals in, or the same mission, really. So that, that has just been very energizing to me. So. I think one of the most important points to make about this is that we are quite consciously and mindfully setting out to think about how we can create a new site and sustain a new site and build a new site that is designed to increase civic engagement. I think I speak for most of us as journalists, we always thought we were sort of about, you know, helping citizens become more engaged in their communities by giving them the information they need. But we didn't sit around going, well, now how exactly would one design a... So this is the interesting moment, I think, in the changing journalism landscape that really makes this such an important initiative because we are trying to figure out, so how do you answer that question? How do you reach people? We know a lot more about, you know, people want it, when they want it, where they want it, how they want it, and they want to be co-creators of it and all that. But what kind of journalism reaches people? We know that they don't want journalism that just denigrates the community and makes everybody afraid to go there, overstates the crime, and perpetuates all kind of idiotic notions. But how do you do it right? So, you know, this, we, we feel that this can really help in terms of best practices um, that can be useful for many. Or we hope so, Tom. I'm curious, are you, are you collecting data on civic knowledge, like how much do people learn about how to access services? or Because there are, there are uh, studies in LA that suggest there are huge parts of this region where people don't even know if they live in a city or the county or a suburb. Oh, I mean, they move around, that they don't have a strong sense of even the identity with the place. So I'm curious if, you, if you're benchmarking some of these things. I wish Nancy were here, that in the survey work, one of the things that we ask are what are the primary concerns that you have about your community? Uh, and we ask, I believe I'm not making this up, uh, that we ask about their, their attitudes towards their community. Um, and also we do focus groups where we get a lot more of that textured information and the focus groups kind of initially allowed us to identify what are the main concerns and interests of people. And out of those focus groups, if you look at the transcripts, they don't know anything about city government. And the Chinese have a different view from the Latinos. The Latinos feel they've arrived because they've come from East LA. Okay? The Chinese feel they're en route. <laughs> to Hacienda Heights or Same to really. Arcadia. Yeah. Arcadia. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, all, with all these multiple mm -hmm. kind of sources of information, we, we can tease that out. Another important point, when we initially interviewed the city manager and some of the, the folks, um, their attitude was they don't need to know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. They can just watch what we're doing. Okay. So there was no kind of orientation on the part of officialdom to engage the residents. So we're hoping that will change as well. But um, so far, as far as I know, we haven't actually done a survey specifically asking those questions of civic knowledge, um, we could ask. which is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It yeah. is a good idea. Yeah. Um, I think since we're talking about civic engagement, one thing that is going to be really interesting in the next few months is how the, um, the, the district redistricting plays out, especially the race between Ada Chow and uh, Madeline. 
uh, that's going to be really interesting because Ed Chow has kind of the democratic, uh, the, the democratic kind of structure behind him with Judy Chu and Mike Gang and all these people. Matthew Lin has a kind of conservative Chinese American business establishment behind him, and so I think that is going to uh, that doesn't just affect Alhambra; it affects you know San Marino, San Gabriel, Monterey Park, and the, the whole the new district. But it'll be really interesting to see how how that battle kind of plays out along those lines. Um, because that, it seems like that is going to be a closely contested race. Um, I mean, a couple other points. I think um, it's also very interesting that, because in the San Diego Valley for a long time, it was the Chinese media that kind of broke stories. Mm -hmm. it, even, even something as simple as finding out the newest, best restaurants you would look to the Chinese media, or trends in housing, or anything like that, you'd look to the Chinese media. So it's, it's quite an accomplishment that the Chinese media is now you know, taking leadership from the Alhambra stores. I think that uh, is something to be noted. And also just um, having such a large cadre of community contributors is also a great accomplishment. I mean, for myself, my wife and I, we work full time, we have a small child. Uh, but to be able to keep us in the fold as people who have Extremely limited free time is definitely um, something to be good on. So, Neil, can you just explain your connection to USC and oh, to sure, sure. Uh, I So I got my MA in online journalism in 2006 from Annenberg. Uh, I took classes with uh, Felix Gutierrez was here, I think he left, and with uh, Professor Parks while I was here. Um, and so I found out about the source a couple years later through the alumni newsletter. I saw that you know, there was some kind of research going on about the city of Alhambra. So I sent an email to uh, Professor Parks and I said, what kind, of, what, are, what kind of dirt are you kicking up with my... <laughs> <laughs> no, but he, uh, he took me out to lunch and he told me about it. And from there we got, you know, we communicated. He put me in touch with Daniela and we started communicating. Um, my wife and I were really involved around the time of the launch, and then a couple months later, we had a kid, and then we just dropped off the face of the <laughs> um, we're trying to kind of reestablish ourselves. You know. But it's been, it's been quite exhilarating to see the way uh, the a number of contributors has grown, the content has grown, the influence has grown. And uh, in answer to uh, someone else's question, it does matter to me that people view the site uh, that, that people who don't live in Alhambra view the site and get information um, about Alhambra as someone who lives there as a property owner. You know, it does it does matter that um, the community is being reflected as a rich place, a diverse place, a place where things happen. Another point I would make is also, I, I think we have a tendency to kind of um, disregard food because it's such a pop, it's, you know, the, the whole food media thing is exploded into this mushroom cloud. It's almost like you can't ignore it. But I think in uh, San Gabriel Valley, it is, it's more than just food. It, it, you know, it's, it's a nexus point of migration for a lot of people. So I think, I think it, food is kind of, I wouldn't say it's more important in San Gabriel Valley than it is in other places, but you have to, you have to pay it its regard. <laughs> Well, that's a nice benediction. And <laughs> close us off. I want to thank the dean on, the, on behalf of all of the board for making this initiative possible. I really, I think it's a terrific thing. It certainly does bring the school together behind something that means a lot to all of us. I want to thank the folks who joined us from Alhambra. It's great having you all. Our new colleagues, it's great having you too. And uh, Daniela and George, thank you so much for putting this terrific presentation together. Really, you did us proud. Thank you. Thank you.